I wanted to ask you about working with Dizzy. I know this was one of your earlier gigs. It must, must have really helped kind of launch you into the scene and been a, just an incredibly educational experience. I just turned 19. Wow. I can't even imagine that. So tell me a little bit about what it was like being in that band. I've, I've heard some of the clips and some of the videos of you playing with him. I know you were playing your big box and Dizzy was doing some more fusion type stuff at the time. But tell me a little bit about your experience with him. I mean, you know, it was transformative in every kind of way. You know, Dizzy, in hindsight, I realized the love and care that he treated me with. You know, in the moment, I was like being the, you know, the brash young jazz guitar player, you know. And yeah. In my mind, I was like, I was like doing it. He really nurtured me along. He never really showed me a lot of things, but he showed me anything I asked him. Hmm. And, but I had some very inappropriate, like I said to him one day, I said, you know, Dizzy, you know, like I noticed, like, you know, you basically play the same lines you played like 30 years ago. Why do you play the same stuff all the time? Oh, man. You asked him that? <laughs> you know, like this is like, you know, never mind that this is my gig. I'm like, you know, I'm like the, the brash young man. Like, yeah. why are you playing that same old? And I, I didn't say stuff, just to be clear. The same old stuff. S, <laughs> S, asterisk, asterisk, T. Yeah, yeah. Same old stuff. Why do you play that same old stuff all the time? And he looked at me without missing a beat and he said, why mess with perfection? Can I can't argue with him, man. Can't argue with well, that. Well, what he was saying was, which is something, you know, it's like a mini artist, you know, you spend a lifetime finding yourself. You want to find who you actually are in your instrument. And when you find it, then you're just being yourself. You know, asking him why you're playing the same thing would be like saying, well, you know, why do you wake up and look the same? I mean, that's who you are. Yeah. And so there was no difference between the music he played and who he was. He had found that thing where it was a true expression of himself. So he was just saying, like, you know, it's perfect. I'm like who I am, and this is what it is. Now, different artists feel differently. Obviously, Miles Davis had a different sort of thing, and and Coltrane, you know, those that are constantly reinventing themselves, then the music reinvents with them, mm -hmm. and that's a little different thing. Dizzy did that not by reinventing his vocabulary, by changing the background. So Dizzy had a big band period and a Latin period mm -hmm. and a small group jazz period and a funk period and a fusion period, all that kind of stuff. He did that by changing the background behind his what he played. Mm -hmm. But he pretty much played the same thing. But it was a master class in, in learning. I mean, I toured the world. I was getting $2,000 a week. Wow, back know, in, in the 1976. That was... Which was like, you know, $10,000 a week now. So yeah, I was, yeah. you know, I had a beautiful girlfriend. I mean, she was like a supermodel. She looked like, you know, literally like Alicia Keys times three you know so i'm living the fantasy life i've got you know two thousand dollars a week in my pocket got this beautiful woman on my arm i'm playing with dizzy i'm playing yeah. an l5 you yeah. know i'm like yeah life is good you know and, and that was great you know and then what happened is that i i did that for three years but dizzy worked 25 days a month wow 12 months a year wow and i literally burned out i literally like was i wanted to like I was into Coltrane and Joe Henderson and McCoy Tyner, and I, I like playing with Dizzy, but we kind of played, a, it was a show, like, you know, we played Con Alma and these same tunes every night, which, of course, Miles played the same tunes with his group every night, too. Yeah, a lot of people uh, I didn't that. understand at that time that the value of going deep instead of going wide. Mm -hmm. Dizzy was going deep into something, but you only get, you only understand Night in Tunisia after you've played it a thousand times. You understand something different then than you understand if you played it a hundred times. Sure. And at a hundred, you understand something different than when you played it 20 times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't get that at that point, mm -hmm. you know, but you, you wonder why Coltrane played Impressions, so why it's incredible. Well, he played it a thousand times. If you haven't played it a thousand times, you have no hope of understanding what he possibly understood in that because you haven't played it a thousand times. That's exactly. just the way it is, you know. I just told, I just couldn't do it. The, the, the day after I quit, Elvin Jones called me on the phone, said, hey, man, I heard you left Dizzy. I want you to join my band. Huh. Hey, you not know? bad. Man. And, and of not course, bad. Elvin was my hero. Yeah. But I was so burned out, I couldn't do it. I just said, Elvin, I, I just I just came off the road like three years of like every night. On, and Elvin toured like Dizzy. Yeah. I was like, I just can't. I can't do that. You know. Wow. So I, I didn't do it. So that was the end of that gig. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. I, I mean, not a lot of people can say they turned down Elvin Jones, but uh, oh, I turned down Michael Jackson. I've turned down wow. Whitney Houston. Wow. I've turned down Christian McBride. I've turned down Ron Carter. The people I've turned down, yeah, you know, it's a good, it's a a, a badge of pride and honor, or slash. <laughs> What was I thinking? <laughs> well, as you said, you know, sometimes it gives you the time to really focus on the things that you're really. At, you I know. created my own pandemic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's funny. You know, uh, I love your analogy about saying 
you know, the difference between going deep and going wide, you know, and, and, and talking about working with Dizzy and the fact that he'd play the same repertoire over and over again and that you really had to go deep and dig deep to find ways to keep being fresh over that. Something I've experienced a little bit playing with groups, certainly in the New West Guitar Group, we play a lot of the same 25, 30 tunes when we're on the road, and you just got to go deep into those arrangements. Um, that's something that certainly resonates with me. I wanted to ask you, though, with Dizzy, it is in the 70s, and you're playing a big hollow body guitar. You said it was an L5 that you were working with. Well, I started with an L5 with a Johnny Smith pickup. And then I, rapidly, I discovered that when I would push that volume wise, the Johnny Smith got really thin. Sounding. Right. Okay. So then I bought a Guild X five hundred. I've seen and that you, was the main axe I used with Dizzy all that time. Yeah, I've seen you with the Guild. I've seen some videos of that, and yeah. uh, man, it sounds great. And one of my questions is a guy that plays a lot of the bigger boxes a lot. Did you struggle? You know, because um, it can be hard to get those guitars to cut. And a lot of guys at that time, you know, people like Schofield were using thinner body guitars. Mike Stern, they're using solid bodies. They're using semi hollows. So, what was it for you? Why did you stick with the hollow body when you probably could have used a, a telly or you could have used a semi hollow? Why why did you stick with the big box? Well, because it it allowed me to do one. Like when I teach, you know, I spent years at Juilliard, Manhattan School of Music, in Berkeley, mm -hmm. and all over the world teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I teach it five things. You know, and the five things I teach are, you know, the linear approach, the harmonic approach, the rhythmic approach, the dynamic approach, and your sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the areas that I'm teaching that I look for students and people. So I was aware of that then. And what I, you know, what the X500, because it was, was a laminated top, although it didn't have a block in it, it gave me enough sound because it was laminated. And it was pretty, it was a heavy guitar mm -hmm. that it gave me enough sort of punch that if I played it through the right amplifier, at that time I was using generally a Polytone 104, mm -hmm. or I would use sometimes a Fender Twin if they didn't have a Polytone 104, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that it gave me the sound I was I was looking for. Because I, I wasn't willing to sacrifice the tone. you got to remember the Dizzy, although wanting to do modern music, was a product of the era where tone mattered. Mm -hmm. You know, where the sound of the music the sound of your instrument was part of the baked in, like, I expect you to have a good sound if you're playing in my band. I asked Dizzy one time, when, early on when I joined this band, I said, you know, we we're playing something. I said, well, you know, what do you want me to play? He said, listen, you're the guitar player. If I have to tell you what to play, then I'm the guitar player and I don't need you in the band. Deep. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. I, I get your point. I, I guess I know what to play all of a sudden. You know, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Suddenly I know exactly what to do. You I know? like that. Um, but so, no, Dizzy value tone. Yeah. You know, he he never suspended his values of tone and dynamics, you know, that, that it mattered. The, I, the goal was not to play everything even. The goal was to play things in a human way, the way that the voice inflects. You want to inflect the notes like that, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so I, I I believed in that, too. And my teacher had taught me that, you know, that really matters. So I, I did that. Later on, I did I did play a, uh, a semi-hollow, not with him, though. But, it, you know, an interesting story about the semi-hollow. I, I gave it a try one time. We were playing at a club called... Um, the Parisian room in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I had bought there, someone had, was like some music store had done say of like $300, a red Gibson 335 12 string. Oh, <laughs> and I thought this would be a good idea to bring it on Dizzy's gig. You know, oh, yeah. I left my regular guitar in the room. I love my X500 in the room and brought only the 12 string. So I'm there, like, we're getting ready to play, and George Benson walks in. Oh, uh, come on. And I'm like, oh, man, this is the worst night of my life. Like, George Benson is getting ready to hear me solo on a jacked-up red 12-string guitar with Dizzy Gillespie. I look like a complete moron. You know, but afterwards, I went over. I was like, hey, George, man, you know, sorry about the guitar. He's like, no, brother, it sounds good. I said, yeah, but you know, it's a 12-string, George, you know, like. You know, that 12 string, trying to tune a 12 string is like herding cats. You know, it was like, yes. it was sort of that kind of experience, though. So. Yes, that's funny, this man. Or digital tuners, you understand. Everything was a tuning fork. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that, that's what I was doing. So. Oh, man. What a, well, that must have been a fun gig to get through. Uh, I can, I can commend you for that. Um, well, listen, I wanted to, to transition a little bit to talk about another gig that you did for a lot of years. You worked with the great Lena Horn, one of the great jazz vocalists. And, I think it's a really important setting for a lot of guitar players to experience is, is working with vocalists. Um, it's been a big part of my career. I've been fortunate to work with some really great vocalists throughout the years. And certainly when I was younger, 
it was something that I did and it kind of helped huh. pull together some very fundamental things on the guitar for me. And mm. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your time with Lena Horn and, and with the other vocalists that you worked with. Sure. And just talk well, a little I, bit. I mean, the list, not to cut you off, I mean, the list is, the game is who haven't I played with. Right. So I have played with everybody. You know, I've toured with Bonnie Raitt. I've played with, you know, Lena Horn and Peggy Lee and Sarah Vaughn and Carmen McRae and Ella Fitzgerald and, you know, Dakota Staten and uh, Brooke Benton and Arthur Prysock and and uh, uh, Ruth Brown yeah. and, you know, on and on and on and on. Right. Cheryl Crow and, you know, all different types, Madonna, you name it, all these types, this wow. is a variety of experience. Wow. So the, the, with Lena Horn, I mean, Lena was one of my greatest musical teachers. She would argue that she didn't know music, but she knew music at a depth that, you know, all, virtually no jazz musician I ever worked with, including the jazz greats, knew. Because she understood how to make the music so intensely human. You know, I, I'll tell you just a couple of quick stories. Like, mm -hmm. one, when I was playing um, and we had rehearsal and she wanted to rehearse, I'm glad there was you. So she said, well, make an intro. And I think it was in, it was in G, as so though I played like... She said, no, wrong. She said, try it again. So I was like. She's like, no, that's not it. And you said, you know, know the song? It's like, yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, of course. Yeah, right. right. And we'll try it again. So I'm like. She's like, no, that's not it. She said, let me ask you a question, Rodney. Uh, are the chords you're playing, do they, do they take into account the first breath I'm going to take before I start the lyric? Are you leading me into the breath I take? Or are you starting the song? Like, are you leading me into my first entrance into the song? Or are you leading me, is it starting the song and I'm not even there? Which right. is it? Right, right. She said, do your, do your chords match the meaning of the words? If you think of the whole first verse and what it's conveying, are your chords implying anything about that? Are they saying anything about what that means, what the intention of the song is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never mind the verse. <laughs> you know. And I was like, no. She said, well, think about that and try it again. And I play something like this. Uh, now you got it. Beautiful. I love so that. So I learned, you know, you hear musicians talk about you need to know the lyrics. And I didn't know that, like, someone at that level, you need to know the space between the lyrics. You need to know what the breath means. Like, you know, it's what in classical music is an ictus. You know, that when the conductor mm -hmm. raises his baton, mm -hmm. this tells the orchestra what the, what it's going to feel like, what the downbeat is. Yeah. Most musicians just say, oh, yeah. <laughs> And her sensibility was so far beyond that, her, her degree. Now, the other thing I learned was when we would play these songs, she would come off the stage in tears, just wringing sweat. And I thought this was really unusual, like, because hmm. the, the, the place is air-conditioned, you know, and but she would just be distraught. And, I, and I, so I said to her once, I said, you know, Miss Horn, what's going on? And she said, what people don't understand, what they'll never understand is that when I sing these lyrics, I live them. When I sing stories of heartache, I'm living the heartache that the song is conveying. I have to relive all these journeys every night. If they're not just words, I'm living the story. Yeah. And so when I sing these songs of longing and heartache and love lost, I'm living that every night. He said, and sometimes it's just too much. And and that's why she was so great. I mean, well, that's right. One of the things that I always respond to when when hearing great uh, musicians of any instrument but certainly a vocalist is is you want to you want to believe that they really mean and feel what they're singing and, and you know uh that's something that she certainly embodied and wow the lessons that you um have mentioned here that you learned from her that i mean these are just nuggets of wisdom that i hope all of our listeners are taking in and trying to digest because if you're a guitar player and, and you have some chances to work with a vocalist, you know, step one here is to really understand the lyric. Don't just know the lyric and recite it, but understand it 
gotcha. have some sort of reference of the greats that have sung the song so you really know the phrases with the melody and the breath between the melody like you're talking about rodney so and if you if you want to play for a singer and play with anybody if you want to play jazz at the highest level yeah you've got to be willing to give yeah you've got to be willing to 